Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Code 42 Live. Uh, today, i am got Mark Wataziak, and we're going to talk about how do we actually define the problem of insider risk. And for those of you who are joining us at Code42.com slash live, thank you, and feel free to add any questions or commentary that you have in the chat or fill out the Q&A. For those of you who are following along on YouTube, welcome. Feel free to have any comments that you would like on the video itself, but if you would like us to be able to respond and answer any questions that you have during the course of this session, please go on over to code42.com slash live, and that's where you'll be able to interact with us directly. So with all of that said, hi, Mark. Um, hey, I Riley. <laughs> Can you give everybody an idea of who you are and what your focus is at Code42? Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, Mark Wataziak. I lead the uh, market research uh, and strategy team at Code. So we're the ones that are digging in deep into um, market problems like insider risk, corporate data leak, things like that. And we spend a lot of time um, working across um, our product teams as well, and just uh, trying to understand the the magnitude of the insider risk problem and also the drivers behind it, because a lot of those drivers obviously influence what we do in in product um, and product strategy. So um, I have a team of of like seven of us that are kind of completely focused and in, in, in ingrained in this this problem we're calling insider risk. And most importantly, if everybody looks over Mark's right shoulder, uh, you are a published author, correct? Yeah, Inside Jobs. Uh, Co-authored that with uh, Joe Payne, our CEO, and uh, J.D. Hansen, our Chief Information Officer and Chief Information Security Officer. So um, fun project, great project. It was like we had five years of uh, just kind of, you know, research and knowledge and insight into the problem because we've been tracking it since we published our first data exposure report back in i think it was 2016 or 17. um and we're like well heck we should be putting this all down on paper and and sharing it with the business and security community and that's what we did we published it uh i think summer of last year i think it came out in september um and it's been great so um you know a lot of what's in the book we'll probably talk about today yeah. i'm sure uh, there's some good overlap, funnily enough. And yeah. uh, for yeah. anybody uh, interested in who I am, my name's Riley Bruce. I'm the security community evangelist here at Code42. So it's my job to make sure that we are creating content like this that explains both what our viewpoint is and just gives information to the broader security community um, to help you all better secure your organizations. So with that, you may see me bouncing. I, I am on a one of those uh, exercise ball things, uh, but that's just part of how I keep my energy up. Uh, but let's go ahead and get in here to the root of what we'll be talking about today, which is what is this thing that we call insider risk? Obviously, there's a well-known concept within the industry of insider threat. However, Mark how do you or how does code 42 conceptualize insider risk yeah so insider risk um is is a little bit different than insider threat i think insider threat is the subcategory of of insider risk insider risk is the we see it as the bigger problem and um you know to put it into kind of everyday terms it let's face it it's corporate data leak so it's it's corporate data leak loss, theft, you name it, um, that is the result of everyday work. Um, it, it, you know, it could be accidental, it could be error, uh, it could be, we, we always talk about insider risk having, you know, throwing intent out the window, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Corporate data is put at risk every day uh, by the nature of the way employees work, the way we collaborate, um, how we take personal, accountability to our productivity, um, the technology we use, the tools we use, um, who we're sharing information with, what is the inherent risk inside the organization to corporate data um, when you're collaborative and innovative and fast moving. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of our research is, 
is not only rooted in kind of what's happening in the security realm, but what's happening culturally, uh, organizational wide. And, and, you know, you could, you could trace it back to the very beginnings of cloud and digital transformation and collaboration technology and, and all of these things about uh, building this workforce, um, highly collaborative, productive workforce with a fantastic employee experience and everybody that's on the same page relative to, um, it, you know, adopting and embracing that fast moving culture and that collaborative and, and innovative and what have you. Um, and, and, you know, we, we found that this was this was a, a, a couple a few years ago as collaboration technology started getting more and more adopted and companies were moving faster and bringing products to market faster and um, adoption of cloud was was skyrocketing especially in the SaaS space. Um, the CISO was over and you know one side of the table which was everybody, CEO, CIO, um, HR line of business. Yes, let's do this. Let's move fast. Let's, you know, we've got, you know, let's bring our ideas, you know, to life. And the CISO is like, well, wait a second here. This is, there's a whole heck of a lot of risk <laughs> wrapped up in this fast paced culture that we need to be aware of. Um, and, and we've just seen it continue to increase over the course of the last few years. And, and now with, with COVID and working from home and, and, you know, companies starting to think about their return to work policies and, and strategies is just a lot of uncertainty. And when there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of risk. Um, and and we're just we're continuing to to talk and listen and learn uh, about what's happening. Right? Um, how is corporate data being put at risk? Um, and and trying to figure out better um, people, process, technology to manage to manage the problem. And I think the important component or one of the more important components here is that number one, this isn't new, right? It is no. accelerating though, because of all of the things that you were just talking about and that we'll get into a little bit more in this session today. But obviously there have always been insiders within the organization and inherently to be able to do our jobs, we need to be able to access data. And there are various yep. solutions that have been put in place over time. And we'll talk about one of those more uh, problematic or failed solutions to this problem in a little bit. Um, but that's the thing that, that really separates insider risk from insider threat is the fact that it is just omnipresent. Um, also, yes, no. I mean, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we're, we're, like it or not, we're all insiders. Um, the, the, the negative connotation of uh, associated with insider threat that is malicious user doing bad things to the company, that is, you know, um, the exception to the rule. Um, we're all insiders. We all introduce risk to the organization in, in the way we work. Um, there's all a certain level of accountability and responsibility to that. Um, but there's also... Um, accountability and responsibility to have the right safeguards and assurances so that that risk introduced doesn't harm the organization, its partners, its customers, its employees, its vendors, its you name it, who they interact with uh, on, a day, on a daily basis. And just as an example here, it's time to actually take a look at what some of those things can be that are driving this business problem and creating the business need. And frankly, uh, to your mind, to our mind, the, the problem, the need is to be able to stop data leaks, correct? Uh, well, to, to manage them um, bef before they do material harm to the, to the organization. Like data leaks are just a, a natural result of the way we work. They're a natural result of, in, of insider risk, of us introducing risks to corporate data. When that leak turns into a breach and that breach is of material risk to the business or that leak is of a material risk to the business, that's when um, you know we got to pull the ripcord. That's when we have to start taking, uh, and, and we have to know when that is. This I call this, uh, I call this slide my security empathy slide. So what started off at the top, I started at the highest level. I'm like, what is security facing today? I, I want to put myself in their shoes 
Um, you know, I, I am in the security industry, but I'm not a security practitioner or security leader. So I'm like, let me put myself in their shoes and see what they're, what they're dealing with. And let's look at it across the entire business. And, and when I, when I started at the very high, highest level, you know, why is an organization at risk and like, what is security up against? And you got to think about this. You got to think about like, what's the man where, how, why is corporate data leak accelerating uh, to your, to use your word, um, Riley, why is this problem just getting bigger? Well, you know, think about this. You've got thousands of users. You have this distributed workforce, right? Work from home, return to office, hybrid. What are you going to do? Thousands of users sitting behind thousands of endpoints with access to millions of files. Um, and then throw on top of that hundreds of vectors or destinations or places that files can go. Um, and a majority both, of them not. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that that's, that's both sanctioned and unsanctioned. Um, and I know that yeah, we've got yeah, these, like, these shadow and mirror IT concepts on this slide as well that it might be helpful to define for folks. But uh, keep yeah. going. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. Sanctioned and unsanctioned, right? So I think we did a, one of the one of the things we found in one of our data exposure reports, I believe it was 2020. Well, we, we've been tracking this 2018 through 2020, even the current one, um, is what do employees use to get their jobs done, right? And it was, I think it was the stat was 37% use uh, unsanctioned tools on a daily basis to get their jobs done. Um, when you look at it on a daily to weekly basis, it's up to like 60 plus percent. Um, and these are vectors like, you know, think about this, you're working from home. Hey, I can work better on my home PC. So I'm going to email myself this file, or I'm going to put it on a thumb drive and move it to my home PC, or I'm going to, you know, you might, we, we talk about in the book, the different types of insiders. And we talk about the people like, uh, the, um, the uh, the sharer right or the the person that stores everything they take personal responsibility for backing up all their own all their material uh, and that's their material and any material they have access to uh, and putting on an external hard drive this happens all the time um, and we see it all the time so that's like the that's like the highest level and that's daunting enough of a problem right to to deal with but then you then you start layering layering in the um, you know, the likelihood, right? So we're always looking for, in fact, we have a study coming out in a couple of weeks um, on likelihood and impact of insider risk. So what's the likelihood it's gonna happen? And then what's the impact to the business if it happens? Um, centered on IP, right? Or kind of unstructured employee, end user created data, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, we, you know, we begin working down our security practitioner empathy card here. And it's like, okay, so they're dealing with a huge problem. Okay, now layer on top of that, uh, when data is exposed or when our organization's exposed. And we started to look at like, what are things happening every day or even on occasion inside of an organization where employee uncertainty is increased, right? Or the movement of data starts to, uh, you know, when is risk tolerance ebb and flow? Uh, it's, it's super dynamic inside an organization. So we're like, oh, wow, pre and post product launch. So right before an organization launches a new product, brings a new product <laughs> to market, their risk tolerance for that information leaking is significantly lower than maybe on a day-to-day -day basis or, or week-to-week -week basis. IPO merger and acquisition that goes without saying we see that quite a bit in the tech space um, with our our tech centric um, customer base um, leadership changes org changes layoffs no need to explain that uncertainty elevates corporate data does some weird stuff when employee uncertainty elevates there and, and then there's the, fourth, the, the concept of you know data ownership there overlays Interestingly, yeah, you, yeah. you mentioned the the employees that take responsibility for backing up their own data. However, that can also extend to employees who take responsibility yeah. for uh, keeping their data when they leave an organization, as an example. Yeah, like it, like it or not, we all have an emotional attachment to our work. Um, and 80% of us believe that, and this is from DER, 
data exposure report, 80% of us believe the work we do, the files we create is as much ours as it is the company's. <laughs> um, and that's across all lines of business, um, you know, levels, roles, what have you, 80%. That's up from uh, 60 some percent last year in, or in our 2020 study. So the sense of entitlement is there, this emotional connection to files. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, culture change. So, you know, as companies start to develop their return to office environments and hybrid workforce uh, policies? Are they gonna spend two days in the office and three days at home? Are they gonna let people work from home full time? Are they gonna, like, as those policies start to come uh, into fruition and be, in, be laid out, that impact on culture, and, and we've done studies on this as well, is like, how much does culture matter to an employee um, in terms of retention? And it's a significant um, lever um, so as they, as policies change inside an organization, employees um, and in the job market we're at, we're in today can hop and can easily hop um, and add on that when employees depart, employees typically take data, um, at least 60 some percent of them admit that they, that they do. Um, and then Which we go my even deeper, to like that why is 30 some yeah. percent lie. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that uh, you know, it, 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 it just, it, it's a lot of dynamic, insider risk is so dynamic, it's like ever changing, you're trying to think, and then you're like, okay, so security puts in these controls, right, they have privileged ass access management tools, they have data loss prevention tools, they have for, for compliance, aware and training, and and they then they try to manage shadow IT usage with a CASB or with you know a network um, uh, firewall or what have you. Yep. Um, and you know there's gaps in these. There's no technology that's foolproof. So when does corporate data sneak through these? When is it bypassed? When is the employees have workarounds? They can work around almost anything if if they have the if they have the uh, the need to do so. Um, so are we aware when those workarounds happen? Right? Do we are we seeing when policy enforcement isn't working, or do we understand how effective security awareness training is, or where we need more focus on on training, whether it's an individual employee or a department, or or a, or a subset of employees, um, and then obviously shadow and mirror IT being you know what is the difference between what's been sanctioned by the organization and what is unsanctioned untrusted don't we call them untrusted domains or untrusted destinations uh at code 42 in our insider product uh do we have the context behind what files are going where um and, and what does the organization trust and then what's their tolerance relative to that and then we just keep going deep right i can go level by level it's like okay so yeah we have technology gaps we need to fill do we understand what those gaps are well <clears throat> understand where the gaps are where you know how is the organization put at risk and we talk about you know you might have employees that don't have aren't supposed to have access to files you might have you know um, employees that are um, considered high risk uh, maybe there's a performance um, uh, uh, improvement plan or whatever it might be or and, and then obviously we talked about departing employees as a and remote employees as as wrought with risk. <clears throat> so, how do you begin to get give give security teams like embrace the empathy here? And how do you begin to say, <laughs> God, how do you how do you what do you what do you do? Like, what's the missing thing? And I think this is probably in one of these other backdrops you have in the future. But it's it's context. Yep. Right. It's and like we can contextually, do we right understand? Now. Yeah. Contextually, do we understand? Right. Yeah, there's going to be ins there's going to be corporate data leaks. Like, let's just admit that we, we cannot block it. Yep. Right. We cannot possibly have the foresight to classify all the data, then write a policy or rule to block that data movement for every piece of corporate data. Now, you may say, I just want to do it for our sensitive data. Well, go and try and define what sensitive data is. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, and then go and try and, you know, we know employees work around it anyway. And we know that a lot of security teams turn blocking off because employees complain every day about it. 
Uh, they come with their pitchforks and say, you can't, you're preventing me from getting my job done. Okay, let me write an exemption. Now you're managing exceptions. So it's this wicked, like, um, you know, never ending cycle of managing tech versus um, really understanding where the risk is. And that's where context comes into play. Um, you know, context around um, where data exposed, where data of material risk is exposed. How do you prioritize what corporate leaks really matter to the business? Is it source code? Is it is it by file type? Is it by um, file uh, attribute? Um, is it because it originated in a certain department? Is it whatever it might be? And that's that's all up to the risk tolerance of the organization and, and the industry they're in and their competitive position and all those sorts of things. And then ultimately, how do you prevent it from turning into a breach? Contextually, we call that right-sized response, right? So today the response typically is, well, block it in line, that's my control. Well, we know that doesn't work. So how do you do it contextually right-sized to the level of risk? Um, if someone puts open file shares up in Google, right? Um, and that's against corporate policy. Um, you know, it's a right-sized response, maybe a Slack message saying, hey, you have a corporate file and an open file share. Can you please change that to restricted to code 42 or restricted to company XYZ? Um, here's a video on how do you do that, right? Or here's the re reason why we can't, we need to have it restricted, give, give the employee context through nudges and training. Um, there might be times where you have to escalate right? Escalate to legal or HR or line of business leader or whatever it might be. Um, there are times where you may just need to put the employee on a watch list. Um, and, and uh, you know, we see this in departing employee quite a bit. It's like um, there's some suspicious behavior, but we don't really know if it's of significant risks. Uh, we need to do some investigation. So let's put them on a watch list so we can be allowed the time to do a deeper investigation and and then take action from there so context is everything right um context is everything and i know that's a you know in in, in some security circles <laughs> it's it's a loaded word um but it's loaded because i don't know if we've quite gotten there yet as an industry uh, especially around data um and what and that's one reason that's one thing code 42 is <clears throat> And that's, that's an important thing to call out here. Two things. Number one, if you're just joining us, I'm having a conversation today with Mark Wataziak, the head of product security product research at Code42, about how do we actually define and understand this concept of insider risk? Um, getting back to the conversation for a second, you know, we, we've spent the first what, 20 to 25 minutes of this conversation explaining how large of a problem this actually is and getting your arms around it as a security practitioner or as a business can seem very daunting. However, the, the traditional solutions that have been out there, to paraphrase you, Mark, uh, like blocking, like policies, um, simply can't get their arms around this problem because of how restrictive and how um, specific it's necessary to be in defining what is or is not important data. The reason that context is so important here is because that gives the human being or the system an idea of, okay, um, let's just use me as an example here, I upload a fair amount of videos and things to YouTube for my job. That's me doing my job. <laughs> uh, put simply, that is me trying to get content out there to the universe, to y'all, to explain what this problem is and how we as Code42 can help solve it. However, if somebody in development randomly started uploading a whole bunch of video files that were, let's just say, screen recordings of their system to YouTube or wherever else, that might be a very large problem. And so that's really why context is so important here, is context includes things like who is the user, what is normal for this user, and also 
what are trusted, you know, you, you brought up the concept of trusted versus untrusted destinations. Um, is this going to a trusted destination or is this going to a public destination that might be a problem? Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, what you're describing is uh, what we call insider risk indicators. So um, this whole uh, idea or model that takes into account, you know, all file vector, all file activity, all user activity, all vector activity or destination activity. So it's, it's, you know, and, and as, as a security practice, I'm going to put my empathy hat on, you know, whenever I say the word all, they're like, yeah, right. <clears throat> we'll believe it when we see it. And then they'll say, oh, that also sounds really noisy. Like you have a really noisy product if you're looking at everything. Um, well, you got to look at everything, right? You got to monitor all files, vectors, and users because hidden in that signal is the context. And, you know, we call it uh, affectionately, you know, uh, you, you just, you said this, the human or the system, um, Riley. And um, there's sometimes there's nothing better than human intuition, you know, mm -hmm. of a SOC analyst or a security practitioner, like something doesn't look right here, right? Or if these three things happen in combination or in sequence, I want to be alerted, right? Yeah, if, it's, I mean... if it's source code going to a you know, personal GitHub or source code going anywhere, right? Let's take something a little less specific, right? If, if security sits down with the chief marketing officer, you know, our, our boss, and they say, okay, what's important to you? And, and Alex is going to say, oh, it's uh, probably our campaign strategy. Um, it's our messaging and positioning strategy. We've got a brand strategy that's unrolling unfolding we'd hate for that to get in the hands of our competitors and, and get a leg up on us and understand where we're going from a positioning and messaging and campaign perspective so i want to know um you know or she wouldn't even say i want to know this but she's like i only want these files that have to do with strategy that may originate by these people um i only trust them being on code 42 trusted domains so google in this case um, I don't want them in box. I don't want them anywhere else. I don't want them on thumb drives. So then security could write a simple IRI sequence, right? Okay, show me whenever marketing's files um, are leave these, you know, are outside of these trusted domains, no matter the time of day, no matter whatever. Boom, right? That's her. That's Alex's risk tolerance. It's very low on a certain subset of, of files and information, perhaps generated by certain users, what have you. That's context. That's context important to Alex and it's context important to security so that then they are better equipped to take alerts that are aligned to Alex's priorities. And you can do this line of business leader by line of business leader, right? And it's um, important to interject um, here that the solution is not to necessarily prevent those files from going to particular locations. However, it is to be notified so that going back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, if there is potential harm to the business, that can be remediated before harm is done. Um, so it's, you know, yeah. moving all of that detection of the, the issue as far left so that then, you know, let's say, a mark in the example that you were just giving the positioning document gets uploaded to box overnight. Well, when the security team comes in in the morning, the IRI sequence will have triggered to say, Hey, this is something that we said we didn't want to happen. And then it would be very easy for that human being or whether it is an automated response to basically tap the human being that did that action on the shoulder and say, hey, uh, here's uh, an awareness video or here's something to, to teach you how to not do this again in the future, rather yeah, than pull it, it off being... a box. No. <laughs> get yeah. it off a box and show us that you did get it off a box. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, 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 we, it's, a lot of it's presuming positive intent, right? And, and the more you see that as a security team over and over again, like you're getting these alerts that and you, you begin to see patterns, that starts to influence where security awareness training is needed, like targeted awareness training, right? So perhaps certain people in marketing need to be targeted with 
a refresher course to your point, uh, Riley, or, or, um, you know, and, and just to understand the why, why they don't want us doing this. Why is this introduced corporate um, data risk or insider risk? And, and, and what is my role in, as an employee in preventing that risk from happening in the future? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, uh, <clears throat> And that's really where we get into the the framework that that we think kind of nicely goes around this, which is what we call the the IRM Insider Risk Management Framework. And obviously, we've got all of the the inputs to this that then get transformed into whether those are actions, whether those are um, enhanced business processes. Um, it basically will get its arms around this problem holistically rather than previous technological (laughs) solutions, which may or may not have at all solved the problem. Looking at DLP very askance right now. Well, we, this is, yeah, this is a, 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 we, we took a very pragmatic approach to this. So, um, it, it was, okay, what are the key, if, if you want to manage insider risk, there are inputs and there are outputs, right? So there are, uh, there are requirements and then there are outcomes um, or desired results or desired outcomes of, of using this framework and then applying it across people, process, technology, et cetera. So step one, like know your risk, you're, you're required to understand your risk exposure. Like, where is it? right um where where across the whole organization right it may be unsanctioned destinations it may be we have risk exposure with departing employees we have risk exposure with the use of thumb drives whatever it might be um you got to identify that you got to take a good hard look across the organization then you got to say then you got to ask yourself and work across lines of business to do this what will we tolerate and not tolerate like what is acceptable and unacceptable Right. Um, and this is important to do by line of business because risk tolerance is, yes, there's organizational wide tolerance, uh, but then there's also tolerance down to the line of business on, on uh, what they believe will introduce material risk to the business. So get a good understanding of that. From that, you got to be able to prioritize. You got to be able to prioritize. OK, what are the risks that matter? How do they um, surface um, across? files, vectors, and users, what, what do we watch for, right? What do we look for? What do we, what part of our intuition do we machine um, uh, to refer back to a previous conversation? How do you get the um, gestalt how can we, out of the human being? <laughs> yeah. And how do you, yeah, and then how do you automate it? Can we automate remediation? How much of this is manual? Uh, it's going to involve, involve manual investigation versus how much of it is, can be automated through security playbooks and, you know, inside and outside our product. So uh, inside our product, inside or, or via a SOAR integration, a SOAR playbook, SIM, you name it. And then overall, your ultimate goal or your ultimate requirement is, okay, if you've identified your risk exposure, you've in- inherently kind of uh, put the stake in the ground on what your risk posture is. So at the end of this framework, we need to be continually looking to improve our insider risk posture. Um, by putting into practice, you know, um, the, the tolerance levels across the business, the alerting and prioritization, the right size response, you begin to see over time how you're optimizing your insider risk postures to corporate data. And those are the outputs. So we, we, we took a very output driven approach, like what do we really want the outcome of this framework to be? And our technology um, and our people process and technology. Okay, so in order to have these outcomes, these results, what inputs are required? Um, so this is the yin and yang of that uh, of that thinking. Yeah, and you know, one of those outputs is obviously we're going to define all of this, <laughs> all of our tolerances and all of that, and those will create policies. But one of the key components in in our belief about solving insider risk or managing insider risk because again you can't entirely solve for the problem you can however manage it and make it so that harm to the business is reduced um is 
having a workforce that truly understands what's happening and what is important to the business without taking the solution, which is, you know, so often used today, which is <laughs> DLP. Um, so obviously DLP does have its place in business when there is defined, you know, the, it's here said known data risk. Um, and that could be things like PII, if it's really possible to write a signature for the type of data that shouldn't go out. Um, you know, here it does call out PII, PHI, PCI compliance information. But Mark, I'm interested in your perspective as to what truly differentiates these two approaches. Yeah, we talked about quite a bit of it today. And, and um, I think that in here, in, in, in granted, you know, security, there's, there's three kind of table stakes in securities, like policies, data governance, and controls, right? And that's, that's what DLP was born out of, right? Policies, governance, and controls. And there's a time and place to have have very strict, staunch policies, governance, and controls around regulated data. That's compliance, right? But compliance isn't the same as security. Like compliance is different than security. If you are compliant, are you secure? No, you're <laughs> compliant. Yeah. So um, when the problem of insider risk started to emerge, right? And when the problem started to have a material impact to the business, just read the news, um, litigation, lawsuits, fines, loss of competitive advantage, et cetera. How do you get in front of that? Because more and more the target of the breach, whether it's an, an external actor mag, uh, masking themselves as an insider or it's an employee, it's not necessarily the sensitive files that we've historically tagged, right? It, it, it might be that marketing plan, right? It might be the source code. It might be the comp customer list that's unstructured that was, you know, downloaded from Salesforce and put into a spreadsheet and then uploaded to a personal iCloud device or whatever, <clears throat> iCloud destination. <clears throat> so, you know, it's this, thinking of like okay there's this obviously this controls driven approach but then there's this context driven approach and the thing is we all we both want the same outcome yeah and we want to mitigate manage stop prevent data breaches the approach is just slightly different right so instead of identify classify policy block you know that policy governance controls we're still policy governance and controls but we look at you know monitor and triage everything right then how do you identify and contain that corporate data leak right how do you how do you have a right sized response and remediation to that um and that's all driven by context you're inherently mitigating data breaches you're just taking it um, um through looking at it through the lens of insider risk or what we call here managing end user risk um, across across all files, vectors, and users, which factor into the formula. <clears throat> so it's a it's it's you know, uh, and and we have internal debates on this all the time. It's like is is IRM a replacement for DLP? Fundamentally, we believe so. Right? Um, is is can they run side by side? Sure. If you want to run two endpoint agents, and you want you're an organization that needs uh, assurances assurances that corporate data leak isn't leaving via you know, end user data isn't leaving via the endpoint um, that isn't tagged and classified and you don't have a policy against it if you want that assurance then yeah you should probably adopt an irm uh, approach to it for that data <clears throat> um, but you know fundamentally with the way organizational cultures are changing which with the way the the movement to the cloud um, that a an entirely different approach is needed to manage corporate data leak. Um, and this goes all the way up to compliance regulations and, and thinking about how you rewrite those that are written for an era that doesn't exist uh, anymore in terms of how people work. Um, how does that get updated and, and how does the language uh, more in line with, with what, again, play my empathy card with security, like 
what is security really dealing with? And then, okay, what are the frameworks and standards and, and language we use um, to, uh, to make sure they're taking the right people process technology approach to the problem? And, you know, going back to the, the era that no longer exists, uh, there's frankly an argument to be made that maybe that era never existed to begin with. It was just the solution to the problem that was easily to hand was a hammer. So may as well use that hammer to try and hit these things that aren't nails um, to solve the problem. Um, so, Yeah, and there's a, there's a ton of varying you know, trains of thought on this, right? So we talk to customers that are, are big DLP users and they, they love, well, I wouldn't say love their DLP. They, they are happy <laughs> with what they're asking their DLP to do, right? Yeah. And, and we are complimentary. Then we, have a, then we have a bunch of customers that have no desire to put in a DLP. They just don't have the people, they don't have the resources, they don't have the money, they don't have the, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a complicated, complex um, solution. It has a lot of requirements on, on the security team to set up and manage and maintain and what have you. So they need a different approach. That's us, that's IRM. They take, you know, they, they were used as, as for their um, uh, policy governance and controls. And then you've got the ones in the middle right, that have DLP for a certain set of, of employees and IRM for another set of employee or the broader set of employees. So, you know, it's, you know, we, we always, um, you know, we talk to quite a bit of, of you know, me personally, I love talking to security practitioners and security leaders just to understand where, they're, where their heads are at and how they're addressing the problem um, because, um, a lot of times a multi-layered approach is needed. Sometimes it isn't, um, what have you. And again, this comes <laughs> yeah. down to risk tolerance, right? And this comes this is down a to how big time... is the problem. Sorry, I was just going to say, this is a great time to plug. If you are watching this live, please let us know exactly that, uh, how you are trying to solve this problem in the comments, in the chat. If you're watching it not live, go ahead and still put a comment down and we'll try and get a response out to you that way. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there, Mark. I just wanted to plug no. that. Yes, this we want this to be uh, a conversation. So feel free to converse and chat with us either directly at code42.com slash live or in the comments on YouTube uh, or LinkedIn. So um, that we've been talking a lot about this DLP versus IRM dichotomy, but one of the, the ways that they are distinct is in the way that they are managed in, on an ongoing basis. And so obviously here we're trying to mitigate with DLP and we kind of have this deploy and then redeploy concept versus with IRM, it's managing this unknown risk that can then be defined over a longer period of time. However, the nice thing is you get this kind of flywheel going on. Um, and Mark... I go for it. No, I was going to say you, 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 you took the words out of my mouth. I think there's been, there's been a few different ways we've thought about this, right. And, 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 you know, this is the whole mitigate known versus manage unknown. Um, there's other things like, you know, um, and, and this is from our, our research is there's a lot of time and effort being spent on teaching and tuning um, DLP technology, right? So we, we call that maintenance mode. So you've got security people um, and, uh, you know, spending their time um, keeping policies, managing up exceptions, um, teaching and tuning the product to ebb and flow with compliance changes and, and things like that. Um, when we sought off to, to, you know, tackle the insider risk problem and we start thinking about it holistically, one of the things we rooted ourselves in is, is we got to help security get out of maintenance mode and get them into maturity mode. Like how do we enable the security practitioner, the security leader, the CISO? Um, again, this goes back to that big outcome around improving insider risk posture, like delivering value to the business. And one way to do that was, hey, deploy it extremely fast, be cloud-based, deploy in, in hours, um, days if not hours. Um, and, and setting it up is, is, should not take as long either. So 
you know, hours to days versus months to, I, I think I've heard years um, from some yeah, customers I, on, the, on the alternative. I had a customer <clears> once <throat> who had been in a DLP deployment for three years. They still had not actually gotten it off the ground. And they had to completely, going back to your comment about exceptions before, they had to exempt their entire R&D department from the any of the policies around USB drive use, just due to the way that those people needed to do their jobs. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's, you know, if you have these super rigid things in place, they don't acknowledge work, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, I think that we go back to the daily, weekly phone calls uh, or Slack messages or emails to security saying, hey, I can't do this. You're stopping me. I got to, and then they've got to write an exception to, to a policy for that user. And then all of a sudden that snowballs to five users, 20 users, hundreds of users. <laughs> I've heard a s scenario, I think, similar to what you're talking about into the thousands of users that have exceptions. And, and that just adds additional complexity. So, one thing that we were like, whatever we do from a framework perspective, from a tech perspective, from a you know, consultative and services perspective, we've got to put together a process, a framework and a technology that is all about defining and prior is all rooted in context. It's all about defining and prioritizing the risks that matter and then responding to them in the right way. And then if you're able to do that, if you're able to machine the security practitioner's intuition, if you're able to understand risk tolerance by line of business, if you're and you're collecting and monitoring all files, vectors, and users, you begin to shift from maintaining tech to maturing risk posture, right? Like security, our, I mean, one of our goals of, of this approach and, and of our tech is are we helping the security team walk into you know a meeting with the C-level execs or the board and say, over the last six months, the investments we've made in our in our data protection strategy have improved the risk posture of the organization X, right? Or our risk posture as an organization is lagging in this area. Here's what we need to do about it. Here's our, our, our strategy and plan. Oh, and here's our budget required to do that, right? So once, if you're able to arm them with that information and that insight and that result or that outcome, the more, um, you know, we, we bridge that gap between what we talked about at the very beginning, we bridge that gap between the super fast moving organization that is the CEO, the CIO, the HR leader, the line of business leaders, and the single person and team that's responsible for risk, <laughs> um, information risk, that's saying, hey, this is risky. We got to bridge that gap between those, those um, trains of thought um, and, and get everybody kind of singing from the same songbook. And the way to do that is to truly understand your risk posture and be focused on maturing it versus maintaining controls and policies and classification schemes and all the things that we're doing today uh, as an industry. The interesting thing or like the a, a particularly important thing about thinking about things from the perspective of IRM is that, yeah, you constantly maturing there, there is an argument here to be made that, well, that, that just sounds like maintenance. However, the difference is, that fundamentally you should always be getting better versus having to go back and fix things that have been broken by your previous policies. Um, so there's, there's nothing that's going to say, okay, you, your users are hitting a brick wall with the, the IRM approach that then, oh, we need to go in and make sure that we redeploy these new policies that have that exception in place. Uh, with IRM, it's we're going to constantly add more and more maturity around it to better understand what's going on, to have better response options available. However, it shouldn't ever result in that employee being <laughs> told, no, you cannot do your job in this moment right now. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it, like fundamentally, if you look at, at 
you know, when, when we <clears throat> started researching this, a lot of it was not, I go, I go back to speed versus risk. It, 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 the, the, the chances that you're going to slow the organization down are <laughs> zero. Yeah. Like you cannot slow the organization down. If you slow the organization down, the organization goes out of business. Like you've got to like move fast. Everyone's got to move fast. It's like call it digital transformation, call it whatever you, the buzzword you want to use, but it's all about speed. Um, and this is about getting security to operate at the speed, same speed, right? Without introducing and enabling them to do so by, by managing the risks that comes with that speed. Um, and I'm going to go back to it. It's like the only, it's, it's not visibility. It's not, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it's not just technology. It's, it's context. It's like understanding um, across all files, vectors, and users, the signal that those things emit, um, you know, pulling the context from those, correlating it um sequencing it under you know analyzing it and in doing all of that you know rooted in the intuition of the security practitioner and the risk tolerance of the business you're going to be able to prioritize which ones matter right and, and, that and you're going to be able that comes both technologically right having that but then also from a process perspective and an yeah. improvement like it's not it's the the technology combined with the humans and the humans intuition, um, which is yeah. so important there. Yep. People process technology. There's that's never, and it's in that order. It's not technology process people. It's people <laughs> process technology. And that that's like something we take to the core. What about the P I go back to my empathy slide. What are these people dealing with? You know, what processes, what things are happening inside the organization that is, is increasing the likelihood of a data leak corporate data leak of material risk to the business um and then do we have the right technology to manage that risk so um you know people process it we're we're big i'm big on threes everyone will probably <laughs> start to learn that about me file vector user people process technology um so deter detect disrupt which we haven't even talked about yeah yet. that's the other one <laughs> detect investigate respond uh, so now, now seems like a great time to go ahead and bring it back here to the, the initial question, which was, what is the difference between insider risk and insider threat? Um, so this does say about our book. However, um, we've already talked about that, but really the, the difference here is in scope, Right. Um, it's, it's in scope and then it's also in not labeling or not assuming that there is a problem where there may not be. Um, so it's taking the stigma away from insiders with the insider threat nomenclature there. Uh, so Mark, I, do you have any closing thoughts here on the difference between insider risk and insider threat? Yeah. I, I mean, we talked around a lot of this, um, in you know in this linkedin live uh or youtube you know code 42 live um and in it's i think at its core um it is about protecting data in the end right uh insider risk the problem is a corporate data protection problem right um and i'm going to go back to to like fundamentally you cannot slow the pace of employees that are innovating collaborating and creating but you can manage the risks that are introduced um, the exfiltration risks the leaks the you know potential breaches um, that is a result of that collaboration innovation creation um, what have you um, fundamentally if you solve the insider risk problem or are you uh, to Riley's point, you're never going to solve it. If you address the insider risk problem, perhaps through our IRM framework and our product insider, perhaps in other ways, you're inherently going to solve the problem on the other side of the fence, the malicious user, the 1%. You're going to see them in the bigger picture that is insider risk. 
Um, so solve for the bigger problem first. Uh, it'll take care of the of the malicious insider problem. Yeah. Presume and positive intent. That's what we say. Yes. Uh, and that's an important thing here as well, uh, is that the there is no assumption of malintent. There is no assumption that the user is a threat um, in the insider risk management way of thinking about things. Uh, and with that, I want to say thank you very much, Mark Watasiak, for your time today talking about insider risk and defining the problem for everybody who's joined us. Uh, join us again in two weeks where we'll be officially kicking off this series with Greg Martin from Sumo Logic. And we will be having a conversation about how to integrate and correlate a whole bunch of different data. So with that said, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone who joined us. Uh, any closing comments? No. Thanks, Riley, for hosting. These are always fun. I know we've done, a, I think we've done two or three of these now, but I'm really looking forward to the next session with, with Sumo. Um, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, it will. Plus, well, I don't, plus the, the audience doesn't have to listen to me talk for an hour. <laughs> and you. Hey, uh, I think that <laughs> I really enjoy just listening to the two of us talk. So clearly that's the only thing that matters. <laughs> <laughs> well have a great rest empathy of your riley day. have empathy oh, for the no audience. can't won't <laughs> <laughs> have a great rest of your day everyone and mark thanks again for your time uh that's it for today peace out thanks all <laughs>